Welcome in to another edition of Next Level. I'm Tommy Ashley. That's Greg Barnes. We're sponsored by Johnny T-Shirt, johnnytshirt.com. And Greg, it's always fun doing these with you. Um, you know, we have an opportunity to do things outside of the scope of just covering ball games and reporting on what athletes say or what the score of a game was. And certainly that's a, a gigantic part of sports reporting and coverage. But shows like we're going to do today are just as important because of the historical thing of it, the, the historical aspect of sports. And so I want to introduce Ron Smith. And for folks that are familiar with Next Level, about two years ago, Greg and I sat down with Ron and went over the Tar Heel book, Volume 1, a comprehensive, historical, just a, a massive project, Ron, that you put together. First of all, welcome to the show. Uh, I don't know if we can talk to somebody that has more detailed knowledge of North Carolina history, North Carolina basketball history. So thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, I love talking to you guys. I love talking about um, this project. And um, it started, I've mentioned before, it started um, in 2005 when my late wife was doing cancer treatment at Duke. And I went to the library at Duke um, of all places to um, to just start looking up basketball articles just to get my mind off of her situation and um, kind of escape into something else. And so one day we were at Barnes and Noble and I saw a book um, called Rolling with the Stones by Bill Wyman. It was a coffee table book and Wyman, the bass player for the Stones had saved pretty much everything since day one back to 1962. And I said to her, gosh, I wish somebody would do this on Carolina basketball. And she said, why don't you? And I said, you're crazy. I could never do anything like this. And she said, yeah, well, but you've been saving all that stuff since you were a kid. And, um, and so <clears throat> it just kind of started, you know, um, uh, you know, just me going and, and looking up basketball articles, then she passed and it really became a grief project to where I went back beginning in 1911, got all the box store scores and put together the statistics and the results and dates of games and rosters. And um, I was finding that in the official records, there were not to, to be presumptuous. And I, and I told Steve Kirshner, I don't mean to be presumptuous in saying this, but I'm finding some mistakes in the rosters versus the box scores. And, um, excuse me. <coughs> um, and he said, no, you're not being presumptuous. Go, go for it. And, um, so I put together, I guess, from 1911 to 1945 statistics, rosters, um, correct. What, what were correct rosters based on the, what the box scores said who played. And that's where it ha began. And it, um, is evolved since then, since 2005. The first book came out in 2021, 1911 to 1961, McGuire's last season. The second book was going to be um, Dean Smith, um, I guess Dean Smith period, 1961 to 1997. That would have been about 700 pages. So um, just we, we kind of punted last summer and and said, um, why don't we just do decades? So, um, so the second book came out in November and it's 1961 to 1969. I'm currently, um, all in on volume three, as far as the seventies, 1970 to 79, the really cool thing about UNC basketball that no one else can say, and it's just, it's so cool that, they played in the national championship game every decade, beginning in 1946, 46, 57, 68, 77. Um, oh, gosh. 82, 82, 81, 82. Yeah. 81, 82 every decade. So with that being the case, the first book, uh, the cover is the 57 team celebrating the second book is Charlie Scott cover against UCLA. The third book will be Phil Ford on the cover against Marquette. 
So every book will have a national championship game cover, which nobody else can do. <laughs> yeah, let me show people that. Um, if you're watching this on the YouTube version, this is the first one. Um, the 57 team, just a, this is, this one's heavy. Uh, now this yeah. is a traditional coffee cover, uh, coffee table book here. Um, volume one from the beginning. And that's the cool thing about Carolina bas basketball. And I want Greg to get in here, but Carolina has ties through Dean Smith, Fog Allen, Naismith to the beginning of the game. And so if folks want to go back to the very beginning where they're literally throwing a ball in a peach basket, this book's got you covered. Now you mentioned Dean Smith in volume two. And, and when you said, when we talked before, you were going to do one book on Dean Smith, yeah, I said, I you're going to need wheelbarrows to carry that thing <laughs> yeah, around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this is volume two. And this is the one that dropped this past November that we're talking about today. 61 to 69. Greg, get on in. Just so much to talk about. It really is. And there are a couple of things I want to say here as we get started. Um, the first thing is that the amount of success that the North Carolina basketball program has had um, has really allowed us as, as fans and media to kind of appreciate it and grow up along with it. And as Ron has done just a, a fantastic job kind of documenting this from the, from the very beginning, but there are just so many stories. Um, I mean, th this book is from the sixties, which I wasn't born yet in the sixties. And yet I remember being told these stories from, from my dad and from, from friends, dads. Um, and that's how fandom grows is it's passed down from generation to generation and you share these stories and you form those bonds. Um, so the fact that there are so many stories here, uh, I've gone through most of this, this book that, that Ron sent us and I'm, I'm, I want more, <laughs> which is crazy just for one, one decade, uh, you know, 60 years ago. So, uh, it, it really is fascinating. And you mentioned Steve Kirshner. Um, Kirshner has a, a passion for college basketball, but he really has a passion for North Carolina basketball. He's been in the sports communication department at Carolina, um, I think dating back to the early 90s. It may have been the late 80s. So he's been around. He's seen everything. And before him was Rick Brewer. So those two, and Matt Bowers has done a lot as well, just their, their interest and their knowledge uh, really kind of spurred them to dive into a lot of the, the history. Um, and that kind of sets the, the foundation for a lot of the records that, that we can talk about. Um, and as Ryan said, you know, you, you can always dive deeper, which is what he's done here. And so if, if you have a passion for North Carolina basketball and you, you, you've got a, a parent or a grandparent or even a great grandparent who loves these, these Tar Heels and has, has shared the stories um, this is a good way to kind of bond and kind of rekindle some of the, those memories. Um, before we get to the sixties, one thing that really stands out to me in, in this book run is the photography. Um, an incredible amount of photos that I've never seen before. Uh, and one of the granted we're, we're 40 pages in, but there's a picture of, of Frank McGuire and, and Dean Smith and Dean Smith's first year as an assistant coach back in, I guess it was before the uh, 58. 19, yeah, 58. 58, August 58 uh, was when, when Dean arrived. This is an incredible photograph, and there, there's a bunch of those. So, so let's start there in terms of how, how did you come about finding uh, all these uh, photos that insert in these books? Well, first of all, let me just throw out there very quickly. Um, one of the great trivia questions that I came up with on this um doing all this research is coach Smith got to UNC in the summer of 58. Um, and then there was another assistant coach who got to the ACC that same summer or spring. Um, and both of those assistant coaches trivia question ended up being the all time wins leader in their particular sport. Dean Smith, college basketball, and the other assistant, I'm not going to sit here and do a clock or anything like Jeopardy, but um, the other assistant, Don Shula, who, who got to Virginia as an assistant also in the summer of 58 and then went on to be the all-time wins leader in the NFL. 
pretty cool, pretty cool uh, trivia question. Um, as far as the photos and um, one thing that's really cool, I thought about that is, um, I, you know, I, I would look on newspapers.com. I would go through and, and for that particular, um, I don't know. I think the better photo, and it's a spread, is Dean Smith's press conference. Okay. Do you remember that? Yep. In the book? Well, um, I saw that in the Durham paper, that photo. So in the in Wilson Library, the Durham negatives where they're where where they are located. Um, if you go online, you can find you know, the collections in Wilson Library. And so you go through the Durham paper collection and it's in chronological order. But for that particular photo, it's not listed. It um, there's a I found August of 58. No, August of 61 miscellaneous is what the way it was labeled. So I just took a guess. That's it. And found the negative. And I think that's a great photo of his first press conference with McGuire and, and Chuck Erickson um, sitting next to him. If you, um, yeah, that, that right there, that photo is a great. Now there's another, show the other photo. I don't have the book with me. And when you turn the page of Erickson and McGuire and Smith standing together, um, <clears throat> isn't that on the next page? I may be wrong. The next page goes on to the, the chapter two, the sixties with the teams. I was trying to find it as you were talking. I'm terrible okay. at this. Maybe, and I, tab, I, I tab everything. The, okay. the, the bottom line is though, to your point is the photographs are unbelievable and continue telling us the story because folks don't, uh, folks don't uh, log things like they do these days. Okay. <laughs> this is, um, as I mentioned to, to you guys earlier, um, and this doesn't have anything to do with me and me thinking I did a great job. This has everything to do with Charlotte, Durham and Raleigh. And that is that it would be very difficult nationally for any other program outside of North Carolina. Duke could do it. UNC can do it. State could do it because they're all in the triangle. Um, but what I found was Charlotte, the Charlotte Observer, the Durham Herald, and the Raleigh News and Observer were going back to the 40s, were fabulous at categor categorizing their negatives in chronological order. So what I would do is go into either Charlotte, Raleigh, Dur um, Chapel Hill, where the, where the Durham negatives are, and go through negatives. And the goal was, Greg, as you say, photos you've never seen, a, a photographer will go in and shoot a game and they may use one one photo, one negative the next day. And then there's 20 or 30 that were never used. So my goal was to find as many photos in those 20 or 30 negatives that have never been seen. And so there are a lot of photos. And my point in saying about other programs, when I would contact other newspapers looking for a photo from like when UNC played at Kentucky, you know, or, or when they didn't do as nearly the job Charlotte, Durham, and Raleigh did as far as categorizing their negatives. And I mean, I've contacted the Washington Post and, and they didn't. I mean, even large newspapers like that didn't. You know, they looked at me like I was crazy wanting something from the 60s and they didn't have them. They didn't have the negatives. And um, so we, I'm just, we should all be eternally thankful for these people back in, in the 50s from Raleigh Greens, Raleigh, in fact, I won't, no, I won't go there, but there were, there's some local newspapers that threw their negatives away and I won't say who they are, but Raleigh, Charlotte and Durham, we should be eternally grateful for because they saved their negatives and we can put something like this together. And when you look at it, I mean, there's a ton of written word in these books too. And you guys did a, a fabulous job writing that and documenting th that way. But the photographs, like you said, and they're colorized. So it brings out the, the old, um, what it looked like then type feel. That's what I tried to do. I wanted, to, I wanted it to look like it's today, not like it was from the dark ages, 75 years ago. 
And that's yeah. why I got it. I found this great colorization artist in Long Beach, California, Patty Allison. Her website is imbued with hues. And I gave her obviously lots of credit in the book, but she is incredible as far as making those photos look real and that they weren't colorized. Yeah, it, it is unbelievable. I mean, it is literally, you can spend hours and hours and hours just thumbing through one volume of it. Now we have two volumes and we're talking about the Dean Smith 61 to 69 volume, volume two of, do you want it referred to as the Tar Heel book, the Tar Heels, or well, just the um, encyclopedia of Carolina basketball? Well, that's kind of what it ends up being. Um, but the Tar Heels, the Tar Heel book, the, obviously our website is the tarheelbook.com where you can order the book. Um, but, you know, the Tar Heels volume one, the Tar Heels volume two, um, you know, this um, one thing that I did and tried to do that's di that I feel like is a little bit different because um, I've had I had several friends um, who played for Coach Smith that I've gotten to be buddies with over this period of time. Um, you know, they 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 would say, you know, what are you going to write, you know, about Coach Smith that hadn't been written? Um and the way my brain works is, um, as you can see from the way the books are laid out, my brain just works chronologically. I like, in fact, you'll see some of the captions under the photos. It'll say February 16th, 1961. It'll have dates under that. That's the way my brain works. And so what I tried to do with Coach Smith and what I wrote at the beginning of the book in the first chapter is I took Fog Allen in the 1890s and how he became big with his brothers be, being a barnstorming team. And um, James Naismith, now this is the key to Allen and then, and then Coach Smith getting playing for, for Coach Allen. Naismith invented the game, but Fog Allen was the P.T. Barnum of the game. He was the guy who understood this is a great game. It can, be, it can become really big. And he marketed the game. Um, he, he staged what he called the World Championship of Basketball um, in Kansas City. And I can't give you the date, 1899 to um, 1901, something like that. But he was the first. And, and he and, and Naismith had a falling out because of that, that, that Naismith believed the game should just be a recreational game in the Y, whereas Allen said, no, this, this can be much bigger. And um, so he's the first guy that in the twenties, he, he produced a shoe, uh, had a radio show, did clinics. He's the first fog. Allen's the first guy that did that marketed the game. And Dean Smith learned from that. And um, so I, I trace the, so what I believe is a little different as far as what has been written before about coach Smith is I did this chronologically. Um, instead of just writing down what Coach Smith did as an assistant, I zeroed in on, okay, what did he do his first year, 58-59? What did he do his second year, 59-60? What did he do his third year, 60-61? I have it in chronological order, like when he went to the Pines restaurant, you know, I dated that, those kind of things. You know, it's not um, earth-shattering, but I tried to get more of a chronological order kind of thing. And I'll just throw this in since we're in that early, early part. One thing I've, I found that I did not, that I did not realize um, is another kind of interesting little trivia thing. Um, summer of 58, um, 57, 58 recruiting class, Coach McGuire recruited Donnie Walsh. So he, Donnie got there at the same time as Coach Smith. So, Coach Smith only coached one freshman team, and Donnie Walsh was his leading scorer on the 58-59 freshman team. So then Donnie played for Coach McGuire in 60 and 61, and then his fourth year, his third year playing varsity, he played for Coach Smith. Then he went to law school, and in 63, 64, and 65, he was Coach Smith's um, graduate assistant. So Donnie Walsh was and Coach Smith were together from 1958 to 1965, and no one else in in Coach Smith's first what seven years, uh, Donnie was with him. And so when I talked to Donnie 
um, I really wasn't aware that they had been together for seven years. And so I expected, um, I expected when I talked to him, not for him to be negative about coach Smith, but it really surprised me how close they were that, um, that when he talked about coach McGuire, who he, who his dad was a good friend with, um, and, and Coach McGuire gave his parents like a baby gift when Donnie was born. Um, that's how close the families were. I really expected Donnie to kind of go on and on about Coach McGuire. He went on and on about both of them. He just said, I've never met a finer man than Dean Smith, and um, went on and on about Coach Smith. And, and, and I'm, I'm just surprised. I was a little surprised at how close they were. It's, uh, it's certainly fascinating. Let me just right here in the middle of this talk about where you can get this book right fast. Um, it's at Johnny T-Shirt, and Johnny T-Shirt sponsors of Inside Carolina. And you know if you're an Inside Carolina premium subscriber, they give you 10%, and you can get this fantastic book at 10% off at Johnny T-Shirt. It's available everywhere else on Franklin Street pretty much, and, and you can order it across the land, and I'll let Ron talk about their website and all, but... Take a moment when you're in Chapel Hill to go to Johnny T-shirt, get it in your hands, pick it up, see how heavy it is, see how how not as heavy as the first one, not as heavy. Oh yeah, as yeah, maybe half as heavy as the first one, but <laughs> together you can certainly get it. You you need to double bag if you get a bag at any store. You buy this book, um, so it's fascinating. Johnny T-shirt takes care of it, and also our other sponsor, Congruity and congruityhr.com front slash Tar Heels for your. HR needs. I know Greg wants to get in here and I want him because he's much more knowledgeable to me, but this is something that I've always, this book sort of helped me understand Dean Smith's early beginnings, maybe differently than I had before. We know about how it started. He was eight and nine. We know eventually he got hung in effigy, but we had always heard, or I, I'd always heard or assumed that Larry Miller and Bob Lewis were the keys that started Dean Smith to what we know Dean Smith to be. But in fact, it was Cunningham. It's Billy Cunningham. I mean, yeah. And, and the story, and I want you to relay it, but the story about his father being ticked off that Frank McGuire was not there anymore, but Billy kept his word and, and came to North Carolina. But for that, who knows what we're talking about there's, today in there's 2024. No there's no question. It, um, one of the people that I've gotten to know, and, and this is like one of probably the, the best thing about this project is these people who have become friends. Uh, and one of them uh, is a guy named Marty Brenneman, who graduated from UNC in 65, 40 uh, year voice of the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, he called me out of the blue one day right after the first book was released. And through that phone call, we got to be buddies. So I called him last summer because he was there. He was in school when all that happened, the, the hung in effigy and, and he's buddies with, he used to do ACC games with Cunningham. And I said, Marty, here's what I think. I think that Billy Cunningham is the foundation of, of, of the program of the, of the sixties that led to Bob Lewis, Billy, um, Larry Miller, Charlie Scott, um, so he, so Marty wrote the recap of the sixties for the book. And, and so, yeah, Billy told him that story that actually what had happened was just what you said that, that Billy's dad, who was buddies with Frank McGuire from New York was really upset that Frank was leaving. And he said he wanted Billy to leave because Frank, you know, was leaving and, and that was a surprise, but Billy said, no, I'm staying. And so another great blessing through this for me is, is my friendship that I developed with Bob Lewis, who set the all time single game scoring record in 1965 of 49 points. I guess Joel Barrett, no, um, RJ came close to breaking it last night, but, um, but, but he still holds the record 49 points. And, so when I was talking to Bob two summers ago, a year and a half ago, um, one thing led to another. I went up and had lunch with him. He lives in outside Annapolis and he gave me the game ball, um, for that game, that 49 point game. And now it's uh, in the museum. Um, and so Bob told me, um, 
he would not have, he his deal he he um he loved Billy Cunningham and that's the sole reason that he came to UNC. He gave me the list of schools he was considering. Um, but at the end of the day, when he came to visit and Cunningham showed him around, he, he came to UNC because of Billy Cunningham. And then Bob Lewis and Billy Cunningham uh, and Mike Cook, uh, who, who played in 62, 63, and 64, they recruited Larry Miller. And, um, and then those guys – you know, help recruit Charlie Scott. So, and then, and then you throw in Tommy that um, if Billy had not been playing in 63, 64 and 65, there is just not, you just don't have any idea how many games they would have won. They would not have their record. Dean Smith was over 500 for those three seasons. He would, I don't think he would have been over 500 without Cunningham. Cunningham was ACC player of the year in 19, 65 and if you notice on the book um charlie scott's on the cover but but to be honest with you it was uh, kind of a flip of the coin of who was going to be on the cover cunningham for the 60s or scott for the 60s and scott won out for two reasons because he's the first african-american player to play at unc but then secondly he 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 was on a national. He was on a team that that played for the national championship. So that's kind of the theme of what we're going to try to do with each cover is a national championship game or, or win. So, with you mentioned Bob Lewis, and I, I was going to talk about some of what you just talked about. Uh, but in watching RJ play the way he did against Miami on, on Monday night, uh, as a media guy. Uh, immediately go to the the record books whenever somebody's getting close to records and you know that Billy Cunningham's up there, you know, Lenny Rosenbluth's got a a bunch of uh, marks in that scoring record. And then at the top, as you said, is is Bobby Lewis is is 49. The interesting thing, and you've already mentioned this a couple of times on our show today. uh, We all have, our own historical references with Carolina basketball, but sometimes it's passed down. Sometimes you hear it anecdotally and it may not be actually factual. Um, And I think you've done a great job with that of really kind of detailing exactly what happened. Um, And everybody, you know, kind of associates Billy Cunningham with Dean Smith and being the, the first big guy. He wasn't the first big recruit though, was he? No, he wasn't. And that's, that's very significant, and that's why I think Lewis should be recognized um, more than he is, because in in the the spring of '63, a year and a half after Dean Smith got the job, he amazingly was able to sign two first team Parade All Americans. There were no McDonald McDonald's All Americans then; it was Parade or Scholastic Magazine. Um, and so Lewis and Ian Morrison were, were first-team All-Americans. They were on the Ed Sullivan Show with Lou Alcindor, Dave Sorensen, and Edgar Lacey, Lou Alcindor being Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And um, that's, that's, that's really amazing that, that he was able to sign two first-team parade All-Americans a year and a half after he got the job. And, and the reason I recognize Lewis uh, so much because – He's the first guy. He's the guy who took a chance. You know, he he didn't know what he was walking into. Um, they hadn't won national champ, or they had, but Dean Smith was still an unknown coach when Bob Lewis committed, and um, and it, I just think he he took the chance. And then Larry Miller the next year, with the help of Cunningham and Lewis recruiting him, and Mike Cook, as I said. Um, but uh, I, you know, I, I, as, as you see, I really in '67, '66, and '67, I give Bob Lewis a lot of credit, and um, I think the reason nobody has broken that record, um, I mean, you know, Jordan, any number of players could have broken it, and and Lewis said that he said it's always surprised me, Hansborough, somebody didn't break it, and I just think. Um, as Dean, as Coach Smith was um, was trying to get the program established, I think it helped the program to have Billy Cunningham score 48 points in 64, 65 season. And then Bob Lewis break. That gave the, 
that gave the program some some ink, you know, with those two guys breaking scoring records. So, um, um, and then in '66, the team broke the. Um, oh gosh, again, I, it's on the top off the top of my head against William and Mary. I think um, the all time hundred and whatever points um, that they um, scored against William and Mary. And that was another one that um, when they scored that number of points, Coach Smith was carried off the court. And I think it was December 65. And and it was because the fans were starting to recognize, you know, they just broke a Frank McGuire team record. And that maybe we are going to be good again. So that's why that's why that was such a big deal when they scored that many points. I was trying to flip through it without making a lot of noise. One thing I, I do like that you do in here is you put those type records up there and you know, you, you talk about Carmichael and breaking ground on Carmichael and all that, but one page that's pretty cool to me is page 107. It's a spread with Billy Cunningham. And it's a spread with his 40 straight double doubles. Yeah. And yeah. we talk a lot about Armando Baycott and all the double doubles he's had. And certainly he has had a ton. <clears throat> um, but 40 straight for Billy Cunningham, including a 40 28 night against, uh, I believe that was against Maryland, uh, Maryland, Maryland. January yeah. 13th of 64. So again, just fascinating. Fascinating way you've put it together from Woolen to Carmichael. The 60s were such a such an important decade across the world um, and in the United States. But for North Carolina basketball, this is where all these new fans today, this is where it starts, as Ron's talked about here. And I'm going to let Greg get in here on the one that does get the most ink and, and, and probably should. Um, be up there in the Pathanon of greats for North Carolina. Greg, go ahead. Well, Charlie Scott, of course. And the question I want to ask you, Ron, is because you, you were able to dive into this, um, Coach Smith kind of had, had proven prior to Charlie arriving that he was a good coach and that he could put together a team and all those types of things. Charlie's arrival was such a cultural shift and such a – um, social dynamic message uh, that that far exceeded you know, what happened on the basketball court. Um, anything that kind of really stands out to you with how that played out as you went through the research of, of that process? Well, what's interesting to me and and um, my age, um, I graduated in seventy nine. Um, so I'm pushing this year, I'm pushing 68. Um, I'll be 68 in a couple of months. So I guess most fans look at somebody my age as older than dirt. And I had somebody say the other day when I posted on Inside Carolina, some, I posted something about Frank McGuire. And this guy's response was, um, yeah, and I used to walk eight miles to school each day, you know, <laughs> um, you know, kind of digging me, I guess, about my age. You got to work. You got to watch those message board folks now, Ron. I know. I know. I won't tell you my my handle, but um. So um. So did so going into my age, the deal was um growing up in Charlotte. I remember the whole, and I'm eight years old at the time, nine years old. I remember the whole Charlie Scott, um, Davidson, Lefty Drizel recruiting. And then amazingly, he didn't go to Davidson. He went to UNC. Um, so I remember every bit of that. And, um, and, and again, which is, I think we all have as a, as a, as a retired minister, uh, I strongly believe in the fact that we all have gifts and different gifts. And one of mine is this crazy memory I've got, just got a crazy, stupid memory. And I can go back, um, beginning in 64, 65, and pretty much do an outline in my head for every season from then on and tell you what big games were that year and all that. But but as far as Scott goes, one thing I'll say is um, people will probably ask this if, you know, reading the book is, is I refer to him in the book as Charlie. And 
Coach Smith made it a point of always saying Charles. Well, the reason I didn't do that is because when we contacted, when we communicated with each other first in email, and then when he called me and we talked several times, he referred to himself as Charlie Scott. And then all the teammates that I talked to that played with him all referred to him as Charlie Scott. Charlie. They call him Charlie. And I'm thinking, I'm going to just call him Charlie because that's what everybody else is calling him. So that's, that is the why I didn't go with Charles. Like a lot of people will use that because Coach Smith used it. I didn't because everybody I talked to called him Charlie. So, but specifically – my my com my comment to him when I was talking to him and all the race stuff that was going on and there was as you read in the book alumni um, the the Far West Classic most valuable player um, um, that Miller first Scott was named and then Miller they changed it um, I told him I said you know I was in the fifth sixth and seventh grade at that time and. Where I grew up, that was not – everybody that I knew that I grew up with, if they if they were either a Duke fan, a South Carolina fan, or a Davidson fan, and if you were a UNC fan, which was there a lot of UNC – there were a lot of – Charlie Scott was your favorite player. It didn't have any mm-hmm. – they could, we couldn't care less what color he was. Now, and he said, well, that may be the case with you, but in other places it was not like that. And um, so that that story, the crazy thing is, Greg, is um, I just grew up in a neighborhood that um, we had African-Americans on our Pop Warner team in 1966. And 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 it was and as crazy as it sounds, the neighborhood I grew up in in Charlotte, Charlotte Country Club sits right in the in the middle of the neighborhood. Um, But the funny thing is. You go to the east or west, it's lower middle class. You go to the south or north, it's upper middle. It, it was a very diverse neighborhood. So, so again, Plaza Presbyterian Church is where I went to church. That was our Pop Warner team, and it was a diverse Pop Warner team in 1966. So that whole racial thing of where he would go somewhere and they would call him names, that was a little foreign to me to be totally honest with you. Um, it, it wasn't the experience that we had in the neighborhood we grew up in. If that, does that make sense? Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, and to get to know Charlie or Charles as, as you talked about and have the opportunity to talk to him about that. And you sort of see from a different perspective, I mean, that's how we all are. And I don't want to get on the soapbox, but we all have our own narratives. And our narratives and beliefs might not chime with everybody else's. And this is the way you document that in the book. And and, and to hear about Scott's, what he had to deal with, the crap he had to deal with, and the team, and how the team came together around him. Well, I, I got um, – I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I wanted, I wanted to talk about the shot against Davidson. Well, just real quick, I'm, I'm, I, as I said, I'm already deep into the third volume. And mm-hmm. I found a fabulous um, editorial for Charlie Scott's last home game in Carmichael written by Owen Davis in the Chapel Hill News. Okay. And so I emailed Owen and said, can I use this for the, for the third book? And he was happy uh, to, yeah, he w- was great. And the point is it really was fat is his column summing up what Scott had been through from, the day he enrolled to the day, he, it's it's just I said this is incredible. What it really sums everything up of what you just said. So I'm going to use that for the third book. Well, there you go. Now now you got us wanting you to hurry up with third book. <laughs> um, but but and I don't want to keep you too much longer. We no, I'm good. for I'm good. 40, 40 wonderful minutes here, and we're talking with Ron Smith, the author of the Tar Heel Book Volume Two and Volume One, um, but two is this one. Dean Smith years, 61 to 69. Ron, the fact that Charlie Scott hits the shot against Davidson, I mean, can you write it? Can you can you make it up? Uh, I mean, just sort of sum up the end of his career in Chapel Hill. Um, 
and ultimately what he meant when you talk to all of his teammates to not just what we think he meant, but what he truly meant to these men and these human beings that lived in the, the realm or the era or the circle of Charlie Scott. Well, it, um, my memory of that, um, is again, this area where I grew up in Charlotte was not far from the, the old Charlotte Coliseum on independence Boulevard. So a lot of the guys that I went to junior high school with middle school, we worked at the Coliseum as ushers back in that day, you could start working at four, age 14. And so there were, and Davidson, that's where, that's lefty's home court. And so there's a lot of Davidson fans in my neighborhood. And um, so what I remember the most about that game is in our den where, where I grew up in my house, we got, we got six neighborhood kids watching that game. Three of them were pulling for Davidson and three of them were pulling for Carolina. It was, it was an experience watching that game with, with half the room for Davidson and half the room for UNC. And, um, and the story, the memory there, and you'll, you'll, you, uh, Chansky, Art Chansky told me this story that, um, how much of an impact John Lotts had on Charlie playing that day because Charlie was going to sit the game out. And, um, and Charlie told me how much Coach Lotts meant to him in his life. He was the best man in his wedding. And, and Tr- Chansky just said, you know, Scott doesn't play that game. Carolina's whole program turns around. I mean, they don't win that game. Um, you know, who knows what happens. But, but the, that is the um, – and then, of course, it's against Davidson. Um, and then you probably read the quote from Charlie that, that he was never trying to one-up Coach Drizell. He was just all – because he was the first coach who got in contact with him when he was at Larnberg. And um, um, he just always wanted to make him proud. And, um, and then Charlie also knew Lou Alcindor slash Kareem Abdul-Jabbar from New York. They played together in, in the playgrounds. And I thought this was interesting. I said, um, I said, did, do you, did you know, you know, when you were in Laurenburg and you would drive to Charlotte to play West Charlotte, or he's also said he, I forgot where he said he went. They drove through Charlotte to get somewhere in at, but Henry played against Henry Logan also. So they would drive to Charlotte a lot from Laurenburg. And I said, did you know when you're driving through Wadesboro that um, that's where Kareem's mother was from? was Anson County. Hey, oh, yeah, yeah, I knew that, Kareem, and I used to talk about it. And I'm like, that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And another thing, Kareem's mother was from Anson County and Will Chamberlain's mother was from Rocky Mount. So um, it is a uh, – it. what it ultimately tells me is how small of a world it is and how yeah. connected – how connected we all are ultimately and uh preview volume three for me um just what can folks expect well and- again again we do each season um beginning in 1970 to 1979 um and what i do with each season is there are not a certain number of pages that i say we're gonna we're gonna do this number of pages i let it write itself and so 1971, when UNC was picked to finish anywhere from fourth to seventh in the conference, and then they ended up winning the regular season, then they won the NIT. That That is a big season. Um, a lot of people who lived then, that's their favorite team is 1971. Um, and then the 77 team, same thing. I mean, won all those games. So So each season is not like, pre-programmed to be this number of pages. It's, it, I'll let it write itself. So you'll have, uh, for, I'll, I'll give you an example, 67, 68, 69. No books were ever written on that era. Um, so I wanted to do a deep dive into those three final four seasons that nobody had done before because no, nobody did a book on 77. Nobody did a book on 71. And my contention is, having grown up in the 60s, they didn't win any championships from 58 to 67. 
I started following UNC when they weren't winning. Duke was winning. So my contention is we can have great, great, great memories without winning a national championship. Okay. That each season is unique in itself. And some seasons aren't that great. I mean, and, and it'll be, there won't be as many pages as there are on 77 or 71 and, and they worked hard, but, but there's not as much. In other words, if you're playing um, the N- okay, 71, they played three ACC tournament games and four NIT games. Um, that's seven games that you're that's going to add to the number of pages. Whereas if you get knocked out, if you don't go to the NCAA tournament, you get knocked out in the first round of the ACC tournament and then the first round of the NIT or NCAA, it's not as many pa- – you're, you're not going to have as many pages for that season. So, so my point is we do a deep dive into every season, and it's going to be an interview former players um, – and get them to talk about games. And for 71, you know, or 70, Charlie Scott, Jim Delaney helped me put that together. Dave Chadwick's helped me put 71 together. I'm supposed to talk to George Carl later in the week to help for 72 and 73. So each season, each each season's covered, photos you've never seen before. And and that's what um, that's what two, one, two, and three, and then so on are. Yeah, there, there is nothing, and I think Greg would agree. Uh, I mean, I've read every basketball book about North Carolina you can find, and there's nothing close to what you've done here with volume one and now volume two covering the Dean Smith era. Great choice to make it multiple books and not 1,000 page um, <laughs> war and peace. Because Well, uh, Tommy, the reason that we self-published – is for that reason, because when I would talk to a publisher, they wanted things cut. And then my my thoughts were, well, if I cut all this stuff, that makes it the same book that's already, why am I doing it? It's kind of like every other book that's been, a, not to criti- I'm not criticizing anybody else. I'm just saying that people would ask me, well, why are you, this has already been done. And I said, well, what I'm doing hadn't been done. This yeah. is a deep dive into every decade. And it's not being critical of any other publication or any other book. But what I would tell the publisher, if we start cutting things, those books have already been done. That nails it. You're absolutely right. I I 100% agree with that. Folks, go check out Tar Heels Volume 2, The Dean Smith Years. Greg, anything left before we get out of here? I got some more reading to do and uh, some learning to do for sure. Mr. Smith has given us all an opportunity to learn the real history of North Carolina basketball. Yeah, um, I'll just echo what you said, Tommy, in terms of I mean, if you like North Carolina basketball history, um, I haven't seen anything as well done as as what Ron has put out thus far. So I uh, highly recommend it. Um, the Tar Heel Book.com. That if you want to order it, uh, you can order it from the Tar Heel Book.com. Um, we've got, we're at Park Road Books in Charlotte, um, Quail Ridge, and let me, let me look at my list here in Raleigh. Um, and then Malaprops in Asheville. So, um, so it, it is available. Um, we are one more thing. We're going to be at the NCAA tournament in Charlotte. Um, whether UNC's there or not, I'll be with Curry Kirkpatrick. Um, and then we're hoping to have a couple of players with us. Uh, but we'll do a book signing either at Park Road Books or somewhere. And it'll, like I say, with Curry, maybe Coach Brown will be there. Um, um, and um, and then who knows, we'll have several players there if you want to get a book and have it signed by several people. That would be pretty awesome. Yeah, and you mentioned Curry Kirkpatrick. He does the forward and this one. Marty Brenneman does, I guess, sort of the afterward or the yeah, recap. recap. Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, th- those those articles are worth the price of the book right there. Well, and then there's when, just so when, much more. When Curry sent me what he had written on the forward, I said, "Well, look, I'm not going to use that in a book. I'm just going to frame it and put it in the office." <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating. I I was watching. Um, I believe it was at the Bahamas tournament, friends of mine that we've become good, close friends with. They were sitting behind Curry Kirkpatrick, and I was like, you've got to speak to that man. He is a legend. And uh, I don't think they ever did. Unless they well, just briefly Curry did. contacted me in September and said, 
let's go with me to the Bahamas and, you know, I can get you the pass, the, the hotel, all this stuff. And I said, I tell you what, I've got this Charlotte show in November all the way up till Thanksgiving. And it just, not, I, it would have been a lot of fun to do that, but we become buddies and we're going to go to the NCAA tournament. He's fun to, to watch a game with, that's for sure. It's Indeed. quite comical. Indeed. It's a lot of legendary folks in North Carolina basketball history. Dean Smith's early years, worth checking out. Check out the Tar Heel Book, folks. TarHillBook.com or at Johnny T-Shirt or pretty much anywhere you get your big books. And like I said, it is a big book with a lot of information for the North Carolina fans to learn about what started it all. Appreciate it, Ron. Appreciate it, Greg. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Ron.